speak to you now in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We began our liturgy with patriotic music. We began it with a prayer for those who have offered heroic service to our country. And the, uh, the hymn that we chose uh, to proclaim our gospel to is actually something known as the, the Navy Hymn, for those in peril on the sea. And of course, I cannot help but, but, uh, but notice that our, uh, our oldest Navy veteran, uh, Mike Georgian, a, a naval aviator in World War II, is here today. It's good to see you, Mike. Uh, it is Veterans Day, and that's a day that, interestingly enough, in a very appropriate way, has extraordinary interactions with our faith. But it's also a day that our faith calls us and our national values call us to a higher standard. I was reminded uh, in the Christian Formation Hour of a reality of this place that we are in at this moment. World War I, which by the way is where we get the date of Veterans Day for, the 11th month, the 11th day, the 11th hour. World War I fought, my gosh, over 100 years ago now. There was a training camp for soldiers in World War I. A training camp. Camp Wadsworth, that, as we sit in this church, was literally right there. I am pointing through our walls toward the little hillside above, above the mall. All of this area around us was actually a military training camp, Camp Wadsworth. But there is a remnant of Camp Wadsworth, actually more than some of the old buildings that are still over there, there is a remnant much closer to St. Matthew's. It's right behind, of all places, the Olive Garden. The Olive Garden is the site where there used to be an African-American congregation. And behind that is a cemetery that is still maintained. And in that cemetery are African-American soldiers who died in training, who were not allowed to be buried anywhere else except in the black cemetery. That is a reality of where we live. A reality that, thank God, we are past. But it is a reality that we need to acknowledge. That the highest ideals, not just of our faith, but all of our national values, are things that we have not always achieved that we have fallen short time and time and time again. And despite that falling short, we still have people that are willing to give their lives in service to those higher ideals. Now, higher ideals, things of ultimate value, I've spoken about ultimate value recently, is also what's being expressed in our gospel reading this morning. We are in... Uh, well, the very near end of the gospel according to Mark. In our reading this morning, Jesus is actually in the temple leading up to his crucifixion, perhaps just a day or two before his arrest. And he is there with his disciples, and he is watching as people go back and forth into and out of the temple. He notices, among other things, the scribes. Now, the scribes were a particular class within ancient Israel who had varied jobs. They were businessmen. They were lawyers. Some of them truly were scribes in the sense of they copied down Torah, following very, very stringent rules. He's actually not talking about their jobs, though. He's talking about the way they choose to present themselves. He talks about those who go about in long robes. Well, this actually is not the long robe he's speaking of. You see, if you were wearing a long robe in first century Judaism, it meant that what you had came from the labor of others. 
You weren't a workman of any kind. You were not a farmer of any kind. You were not a shepherd of any kind. You were not a soldier of any kind. Your stature and status enabled you to live a life separate from the people around you. You were a person of wealth and means. And so you went around in long robes that gave you a certain status and standing because people could look at you and know right away that you were a person of means in the community. All right? He might have said those who go around in $100,000 cars, okay, or live in the finest houses, who, because of their standing, others aspire to be like, basing a person standing on their money. Now, by the way, I'm not saying don't drive a nice car. I'm not saying you should live in a bad neighborhood. I'm saying, though, that those things do not make anyone better than anyone else. That possessions are not what defines us. And to further make the point, Jesus points to the people that are coming in and out of the temple and going to the treasury, literally a box where donations were placed. And apparently there are those that are making a great show of what they are putting in. Now, truly, the only way that you're going to know that someone is putting a gold coin or a silver coin in is if they do something like this. Oh, oh, let me uh, let me let people see what I am doing. See, by the way, does anybody here, if you put a check in the offering plate, do you ever like snap your check and kind of hold it up to the people around you? (laughs) Please say you don't. Okay, (laughs) that's the kind of thing that Jesus is talking about. And then he calls their attention to a widow. Now, a widow is not just someone who has lost their spouse in first century Israel. No, no, no. In the first century, a widow is someone who has lost their spouse and is therefore completely dependent on someone else. And if they do not have that someone else, at the time a male figure, then that means that they are having to subsist on their own with just whatever meager resources they can gather and they have no real legal standing in the community. They are on the outside. Now it's very telling the amount that she puts in the treasury, in the box. We call it the widow's mite. I've actually brought the coin that's called the widow's mite and shown you before. It's a copper coin about the size of my little fingernail. She takes two of those and she drops them into the treasury with no fanfare, without calling to attention to herself. She just does that and she walks away. It's very telling because that's what it would have taken to buy bread for a day. In other words, what she would have had to eat for the day. That's what she gives. Jesus points out that there are those who are giving from their abundance and it's less meaningful, less important than the one who gives from their poverty. In other words, the folks that are giving the large sums are giving from an even greater sum. I'm giving $100 because I have $10,000 over here. Or I'm giving $1,000 because I have $100,000. She, on the other hand, gives everything she can. She is actually modeling her faith. Her faith says, her faith informs her life to the extent that she knows that she is dependent on God. That whatever she has is a gift from God, and so she gives back from that. Now, frankly, that should probably terrify most of us. It's as if we stepped up to that offering plate and we dumped everything we had in it and then we went out of the car and we needed gas and we're like, oh goodness, how am I getting home? Actually, that's kind of a a superficial reading of this because believe it or not, and I hate to say this from like a stewardship standpoint, the reading's actually not about money. The reading is about your faith and whether or not you choose to live your life based on the highest ideals 
of your faith. Now, yesterday was a, a very difficult day for me. But yesterday is an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, if you've read the papers today, you probably know uh, that former Congresswoman Liz Patterson died yesterday. Now, before I became a priest, before I ever went to seminary, I spent six years as her personal aide and then her legislative assistant and then running her district office here in Spartanburg. Before that, I knew her. Before that, a member of my family had actually worked for her father, who had been a World War I veteran, for what it's worth, and a U.S. senator, as well as a governor. I knew this family. And day after day, working with her, I saw the living, breathing example of someone who put both their faith and their service to their country in the sense of serving God's people, because that's the way she looked at it, above her own needs. I am not trying to sort of create a hagiography, a, a, a study of the life of a saint to you. But I am saying that it is possible to live a life that is completely consistent with what you believe in your heart. There are a thousand stories. One that I've shared before, but one that I think bears repeating, kind of fits with this moment. It was 1986, and we were going to a fundraiser in Greer at the home of Nancy Welch. I don't know if any of y'all remember her. Uh, she used to have a television show, a cooking show, I believe. It was going to be a big fundraiser. Lots and lots of people from both Greenville and Spartan were, were, were going to be there. Lots of money was going to be raised. Liz is sitting beside me. She's going through some correspondence. She says, hey, do you know where Alan Bennett Hospital is? I'm like, yeah, it's, it's here in Greer. It's off of 29, just after you cross into Greenville County. She said, yeah, we need to go there. There's a nursing home there now. I'm like, all right, but we, we've got the fundraiser. She says, I know, don't worry about it. So we get to the hospital. We find the nursing home wing. And she has a letter with her. And it has an old campaign pen attached to it. And she goes to the desk and she said, I'm looking for this person. And we're taken down a hallway to the room of an elderly client of this nursing home. The room, honestly, smells of urine. It is very, very institutional. The walls are that pale green, and there's linoleum. S sort of laying down in the bed, sort of sitting up a little bit, is an elderly man with very, very poor vision. And she steps up beside his bed, and I'm standing behind her because this is completely out of of my comfort zone. I'd never been in something like this. I'm 25 years old. This is a very different experience. And she says the person's name, and she says, Mr. So-and-so, I got your letter. I'm Liz Patterson. And the man begins weeping. See, the pen that he had sent in his letter was an old campaign pen of her father's. It said, Roll in with Olin. Olin D. Johnston. It was an old campaign pen from when he was running for the United States Senate. By the way, he whipped Strom Thurmond in 1954, just for the record. In any case, the old man is crying. You see, Liz's father had grown up working in the textile mills, and he had never forgotten that. So he always had a special place in his heart for those who worked in the mills, and that's what this old gentleman had done. And he remembered meeting Olin, and he remembered something that, that Senator Johnston had done for him and his family. And so he found out that the senator's daughter was running for Congress in 1986, and he sent her one of his dad's old pens. And she sat there on the edge 
of that urine-stained bed and talk to him for the next half hour. And somewhere, a fundraising event had started. And I keep looking at my watch, but she is in no hurry at all. And finally she says, I'm going to wear the pen that you sent me. Can I leave one of mine with you? And so he says, please. And she puts the pen on the pillow beside him. Actually, before we left, he asked her to move it to the curtain so he could look at it, so he could see it. And then she said, can I say a prayer with you? And that's what she did. And he held her hand and he wept. And we left the room. I'm like, Liz, I'm, I'm sorry. We're going to be late. We're going to be late. We're going to be late. And she stops me. And she looks at me. And she says, it's never, ever about the money. It's always about the people. If you don't remember anything that you ever learned on this campaign, remember that it's never, ever about the money. It's about the people. You see, you can live out your faith. You can live out even your political ideas, as long as they are consistent, as long as they are not about you or me or our, or, our, or our standing in the community. It's always about service to others. The widow knew this. It wasn't about her. It was about what she could offer. Amen.